How's everybody doing? Okay? All right, I'm going to try not to lose my voice through this talk, so I'm all mic'd up. Uh, if you want to follow me on Twitter, T Hall at Influx, I'm trying to exceed Evan's Twitter following, so we're in a little competition. He forgot to put his Twitter handle up, so feel free to. I promise not to tweet anything about Boris Johnson, hey. Donald Trump, or any political things, only things about Influx, okay? So you won't get my sports highlights or anything along those lines. Um, so this talk is uh, designed to sort of share with you what we've learned about uh, our own monitoring journey uh, of monitoring Influx Cloud. So how many of you in the room are Influx Cloud either users or customers? Okay. So for those that put your hands up, thank you. And um, you'll see what's going on behind the scenes now a little bit um, and how our support team sort of manages and interacts with things. And then I'm, I'm going to share with you some uh, things we missed. Uh, along the way, we're continuing to try to improve, uh, and this is sort of typical of, I think, most environments. What did you know ahead of time? What did you learn as you sort of instrumented, monitored, advanced progress in terms of whatever it is you're, you're tracking, monitoring, be it devices or, or software? So uh, I'm going to give you a little bit of a brief history of cloud, where we come from, where we're going to. Um, we'll talk about what metrics we're gathering, uh, pile on a little bit to some of the things Dean talked about if you, if you stayed in the room from the previous session. A um, little bit of how we're doing the visualization, monitoring, and alerting, um, highlighting a couple of those troubleshooting scenarios, and then uh, go into the things that we missed. So, so many things we missed in the first go around. So, um, so just to, to go back in time a little bit, um, we originally launched uh, uh, InfluxDB, uh, open source, hosted on DigitalOcean um, in 2014. And uh, we got a lot of feedback that more people would come and buy the service from us if we weren't on DigitalOcean. So um, we did have a lot of uh, interest, um, but we moved the entire um, uh, cloud service from DigitalOcean onto AWS and also launched at the same time uh, the Enterprise Edition. So previously, you, were only, you would only have access to open source, which is essentially a single node running in DigitalOcean, which we hosted and managed for you. Um, and at that time, you had access to an endpoint, um, and everybody was required to download and use the CLI, which is a weird cloud service for me. Like most cloud services I interact with, there's a browser experience. And yes, you can gain access programmatically to it, but generally speaking, I don't use, I'm not used to downloading software uh, when I'm expecting to, to interact with the cloud service. So uh, one of the things that we did uh, was then offer new plans on AWS, which included enterprise, um, which delivered the um, high availability and advanced security features that are in that enterprise edition. And then you could consume that obviously as a service. But again, um, the downloading part and not having access to a user interface was a little strange. <coughs> So we enhanced the service a little bit further uh, to give it a couple things. Number one, uh, we introduced the UI elements. So Chronograph uh, was made available as a standard part of the service. So when you spun it up, um, you get browser access, nothing to download if you don't want to. Um, you can gain access to user setup uh, and those sorts of capabilities. We also gave you access to a free uh, version of Capacitor, limited edition. But if you wanted to explore the features and capabilities of that, you would have access to it, um, again, all through the browser. We also introduced um, enhanced capabilities called co-monitoring, which was an exposure of the metrics of the service, the health of the service, back to you. So one of the things that's weird about running uh, a cloud service of this type is that the things that you do can actually perturb the availability health uh, of the service. And when that happened, uh, the support team might reach out to you and say, hey, um, your cardinality is running at a million, and uh, that the, what you purchase from a plan perspective can only support a half a million, so it's time for you to upgrade. And um, you then had to take it on faith um, that that was true. And so what's weird about that is if I call you at the end of the quarter, uh, is it really a problem, or was it, you know, we're short on the quarter and I need a new deal, right? So um, exposing to you the co-monitoring capabilities is really the intent is, we want to make sure that you can see what we can see and that we have a shared view of what's happening to uh, the infrastructure uh, that you purchase and that we're running on top of. The other thing we added was pay-as-you-go storage. 
So one of the things that's uh, sort of unique or maybe not unique about time series data is that um, the value of high precision data typically goes down over time. So I know that is not 100% the case in all scenarios. Uh, I know that we have some people here from uh, linear accelerators. Uh, we have some customers from CERN. Okay, that's not the case. All the science guys in the room um, and gals, uh, they actually care about the high precision data pretty much forever. Okay, but if you're doing a DevOps case or um, certain other cases, um, you really care about high precision data in a time that you need to take action on it. And over time, then you're, you're actually looking for trends and the analysis of those trends, which does not typically involve super high precision data. And so what you want to be able to do is downsample that data and also, also reduce your storage costs. Right? I don't need to store you know, 10 second resolution of 12,000 uh, Docker containers in the CPU that was associated with all that usage in an infinite time horizon. So, but for folks that did want to store their data for longer, our uh, initial plan sizes um, provided some amount of storage. And they were like, but I need you know, another half a terabyte or whatever. How can I gain access to that? And so we made that a self-service option. And then you can, you can buy that additional storage. So that's, that's where we ended in, in 2017. Um, we have over 360 instances now running. Uh, of uh, Influx Enterprise on the cloud um, that we manage for obviously many of you in the room. Um, and so the setup of that looks like this. Uh, oh, sorry, the setup of that looks like this. I actually have a visual for it in a second. And we'll, uh, I'll walk through what we've done from an infrastructure perspective to automate and lay that down, uh, as well as a monitoring perspective to sort of get visibility into what's happening. So the key for us was, as you're going through your development processes, we need to understand the baseline of what your cluster health looks like so that we can be your operations team. And so in order to do that, I needed to instrument and capture the telemetry uh, of those systems. And we then set up notifications for the most common issues before they became chronic or, or hopefully visible to you. And in some cases, we did a really good job, but in some cases, we didn't. And so I'll share both sides of that story. The biggest deal, and I think Dean touched on this a little bit from the last talk, is if you're familiar with running open source, that's what the open source looks like. You got one thing to sort of look at and monitor. When you shift to enterprise, you got parts. You got a couple more parts to deal with. You have the meta nodes. You've got n number of data nodes. Typically, this is the minimum deployment that we uh, recommend for uh, enterprise edition. Uh, two data nodes, and then obviously three metas. Okay, so a lot more to sort of gather and collect particularly if you're um, spreading it across multiple machines, which is best practice for high availability, not across data centers for somebody who was asking that in the back room. We don't recommend that. There's all kinds of weird things that can happen when you start splitting these things off uh, geographically that we don't recommend. So in terms of the cloud infrastructure itself, so what did we have to build and deploy in order to allow for automation? of spinning up 360 plus instances of the software uh, over the course of the last few years. And again, most people are purchasing this as a credit card swipe, right? So you come in, you put the credit card in, you pick the plan that you want based on your use case, and, and it just all happens behind the scenes. So first and foremost, um, in the slides, anything that looks like this uh, dog-eared uh, square or rectangle, that's a Docker container that we have running. So we're heavily using Docker. Um, inside the AWS environment. Um, we have separate accounts uh, set up for both uh, our development acceptance and production environment. So we do the same thing that many of you do from a software perspective is we have these things set up, the software goes through, we test, validate uh, before things roll into production. We have a service called a cluster manager. It has a really exciting name that I didn't put in the slides because it's embarrassing. It's called Potato. Engineers named it, so it's called Potato. I don't know why. Um, actually, I do know why, because it was Potato, and then they used to call these things Tots. Tater, Tot, I don't know, something. So anyway, there was a relationship there somewhere at some point. But anyway, so Potato is used to manage the instances of the cluster. Um, we've got a Bastion host from a security perspective that allows us to have a secure access and mount point into the AWS account and then access the individual instances if we need to. Um, but everything right now, uh, in Influx Cloud is a single instance, um, single tenant deployment, so no multi-instance. That is what we're actually preparing to launch for Cloud 2. And so if anybody, anybody playing with Cloud 2 beta at the moment, 
maybe after yesterday, anybody sign up for Cloud 2 Beta? Yes, thank you. Um, try it out, that's the multi-tenant version. Okay, right now it's only in US West, uh, plans in the next 30 to 60 days to have the European version launched. Um, and we'll do that either in Frankfurt or Ireland are the two uh, most likely candidates. Um, but so today it's all single tenant instance dedicated uh, to you. You buy the plan, we provision the machines, we spin up those instances, and you end up with roughly six machines. Uh, two data nodes, three meta nodes, and a node that's hosting your uh, chronograph and capacitor instance. You can also buy add-ons. You can buy a full-blown addition of, of uh, capacitor or even Grafana uh, that we're hosting and running inside the, the cloud instance. But of course, we're also monitoring. Uh, and I don't, we've got some folks here from France, so I like to refer to this as drinking my own champagne because um, the other analogy I don't like so much with the dogs. Um, and so... Uh, what we have deployed is we're using uh, chronograph and capacitor for alerting, monitoring dashboards, and we're actually feeding all of the data into a single monitoring cluster. You might also notice we're running Kubernetes. How many of you are using or exploring Kubernetes at the moment? A couple, okay. Yeah, still early days, certainly, um, but uh, we've had good success uh, in terms of running the cluster manager and the, and the backup service that we've going. Uh, we're also using uh, key which is, or Quay, if you don't know how to speak English, um, uh, as the uh, software image repository. So none of these things are, are built, um, uh, you know, within the AWS environment. We just have full control over how those Docker images are built and deployed uh, through our, our whole setup. Now, you may be a little bit surprised. I have paper trail up here for log I archival. Um, obviously, uh, if you're a customer and you want access to logs over a longer time duration, um, I'm not storing those logs in Influx. I'm storing them in a, in a basically archival service if I need to dump, jump out to them. We have actually stored the logs in Influx for 14 days. So the, the instrumentation that we get, the telemetry that we get from all the metrics information and the log information for that 14-day period are all being stored in Influx. But for archival long-term, like I need to go back two years, they're all in, they're all in paper trail. So this is what the, it was very colorful, I realize. Uh, it was on a white background, and so I didn't want to blind everybody with that. So um, the deployment diagram for the whole system then on an instance-by-instance instance basis really starts on the, this side of the slide. So there's an ALB within the AWS environment, and we have multiple ALBs per region um, that exist. I think there's up to 90, uh, 90 um, clusters are being uh, routed through a single ALB per region. Um, and then the deployment of the backend processes. So we've got, we have the Koch node, which is capacitor and chronograph, very decoratively named, um, that's running and exposed out through the front door. So browser-based access to the chronograph pieces are done through the ALB. And then the CLI and programmatic access also through the ALB, but on a different port, are available uh, there. Meta node quorum running in the background. Data nodes are there. Um, the security setup is there in terms of um, how we've got this provisioned and configured. Now you'll notice on every one of these hosts, there's a Telegraph agent. And so we'll go into what we did there in terms of deploying those things. A couple other things you might notice, we're using SkyDNS. So one of the things about Influx that's uh, unique um, is that the setup really requires the host, host resolution to be consistent over time. And one of the things, obviously, if you're working in a cloud <coughs> infrastructure environment, is that the cloud provider may pull the machine from you at some point in time, or you may need to replace that machine at some point in time, which means the IP is gonna change, and you'd want to make sure that from a host name perspective, you can continue to preserve that name and swap the IP dynamically underneath. So we have SkyDNS to actually provide the consistent name resolution for us within the infrastructure, and so we can basically change machine names, not the host names, but the machine names and the IP addresses can change all behind the scenes. Super useful in terms of doing a wide variety of support uh, cases as well. So, for example, one of the things that may happen is you may call up with a support ticket and say, hey, I'm having a problem with, you know, something. Can you guys help me investigate? And I'm sure the majority of you don't want me to investigate that on your production instance. If you do, raise your hand. None of you. Very smart crowd. Uh, so what we can do is we have tooling behind the scenes as part of potato, not to be repeated, uh, that allows us to do uh, what we call clone or shadow clone. 
The clone operation allows us to take a snapshot, basically a backup of what you have running, and mount it on new hosts. But with SkyDNS, allows me to rebind all those hosts together, and then the engineers can go in and do whatever kind of destructive testing and evaluation they need to, defect uh, determination, root cause analysis, and then hopefully bug fix uh, if there in indeed is a bug to resolve that issue. We can also do something called a shadow clone. Shadow clone means take that snapshot, load it up, and route your live traffic to it. Now, from a production perspective, it, there's no difference to you. The live traffic is going to your production instance all the time, but the shadow clone is also receiving reads and writes. And so what that allows us to do is do things like pro profiling, um, and additional sort of performance and analysis. But to, to the in, Influx instance that's running, they, they, think it, they think they're each the production instance. Obviously, the results aren't returned from the shadow clone, but these are sort of supportability tools that we have in place to help you as a customer. Does that make sense? I got one other additional thing called Automatron, uh, which is another weird name from the engineering team. Uh, they're really good at that. Um, Automatron essentially is uh, monitoring the Docker containers. Uh, you can think of this as a super, super, super slim down Kubernetes from the perspective that it is watching the Docker containers and it is determining uh, what's running and whether they need to be restarted or not. That's its sole job. It also checks the uh, image instance against key to see if it has the appropriate configuration tag deployed and if it does not have the configuration tag, it goes and pulls the correct one and gets that set up and deployed. From a maintenance and monitoring perspective, we're destroying these containers about once a month. Right? So every month we're doing maintenance releases, we send out notifications, and then we, we basically update the tag, we let Automatron know what the current tag is, and then we do uh, a deployment um, starting with a, what we call a 10% slice. So we upgrade 10% of the clusters, which is roughly you know, 30, 36 clusters at a go. We have to spread that actually around the world so that we're, um, we can basically see what's happening from a traffic perspective and see, confirm that um, what's deployed and running uh, doesn't have any issues. Of course, we also do that ahead of time with some subset using that shadow clone uh, technique that I mentioned. So one of the things as an enterprise customer is you actually end up getting the benefit of that, right? Because I'm going to test the enterprise additions with live traffic um, to see how it behaves and make sure that there are no issues before I actually release that enterprise edition to the world. So essentially, I'm going to drink my own champagne, and if it tastes corked, I send it back to the engineering team to have another turn of the crank, okay? So um, essentially what that means is I don't want to ship any .0 releases, right? A .0 feature-bearing release is typically the most dangerous one to take. I'm sure none of you are deploying those in production ever. Um, and we, we just don't want to ship any of those full stop, right? So what I'd like to be able to do is test and validate with the cloud traffic and cloud environment, first as a shadow clone mode, and then roll out in an incremental fashion over time to ensure all of those things are working correctly before I release that to the enterprise audience. And that typically takes us a week to two weeks to upgrade the entire 360 plus instances. But we do it in a very specific and deliberate manner and if any issue is detected, we'll roll back that instance by just changing the config tag. Automatron will pull the latest, the, the latest update for that machine uh, or for that cluster and roll them back to the previous edition and then continue running while we do the investigation. That may also cause a halt of the rollout through the rollout process until we evaluate what the scope of the issue actually is. Make sense? Okay. So, uh, you'll notice there was a number of these uh, sort of purpley services, shared services within the environment. I mentioned paper trail for log ar archival. We're using Influx for monitoring and uh, potato uh, for their provisioning. And so this essentially, essentially describes what the Docker container or what each of the items are on the other slide. The Docker containers, the S SSH access. We're using et etcd for some rendezvous uh, information between the different enterprise components. Um, and then log spout to route those log information off, telegraph to route the metrics, and then automatron uh, to make sure that those, those containers are running correctly. Um, so we've got telegraph deployed on all the nodes, both the meta nodes and the data nodes, and we're gathering all of these kinds of metrics off of those hosts. So I've got CPU, system, process, the disk uh, act activity, memory, network stuff, 
the HTTP response times, uh, file statistics, um, the specific InfluxDB stats, um, and then optionally, depending on, again, either your environment or ours, I've actually turned on uh, logs, um, the Docker metrics, and, um, and some swap metrics, right? So we're looking to make sure we're not uh, exhausting the swap, and in some cases, we've actually turned that off uh, for lower instances for, for some better performance. Um, so all of this stuff is being captured uh, for the entire property. A um, couple other things that we do. Um, I don't know how many of you uh, are taking advantage of global tags and, uh, using Telegraph, but it's a super powerful feature to be able to add additional metadata to allow you to organize the metrics and stats that you collect. So from our perspective, um, using the global tags, I do a couple things. Number one is every customer who does their credit card swipe, oh, I'll get out of your way so you're not taking a picture of me, because I know that's not what you want. Um, yeah, face made for radio. Um, so, so cluster, the cluster ID is a unique ID that we generate for every, every cluster. If you are an Influx Cloud customer, you can uh, understand what your cluster ID is, at least the first eight digits, because that's part of the URL that we hand back to you. The cluster ID is actually significantly longer than that. We won't get into what it actually is and why, but we give you at least the first eight digits. Um, so we burn that into the global tags for each of the Telegraph deployments that go out for that particular property. And then we also have an environment tag, right? Acceptance, production. So again, every cluster is prod, dash, your first eight digits, your region, where you're located, and then host type. So it's meta, data, koch, et cetera. And then there's a ordinal ID, one through six. Uh, could be larger if you have a larger uh, data node deployment. Or if you have a, a Grafana node, there's a graph. If you have a, a capacitor node, it's kappa. Anyway, so all of that information we're capturing off of using global ID or global tags and then setting the, the various collection uh, intervals for the rest of the stats to be reported back to, to Influx. Okay. So yeah, definitely if you're not taking advantage of global tags, um, I encourage you to explore that particular capability of Telegraph. Uh, from an inputs perspective, when you're configuring uh, Telegraph, right, you get these uh, double square brackets um, and so one of the other things that people don't necessarily know is that they can uh, use uh, name pass and field pass to activate what actually is being passed through from a field perspective or block what's being passed through. Yes, sir. Yeah, it's the same. It's same. Global tag is just the name in the, in the telegraph world for d differentiating um, where you're configuring it. But when it shows up in Influx, it's a tag. Yeah, exactly. Good question. Sorry. Um, so yeah, name pass, field pass. Um, so these are the uh, configuration settings from a system perspective. Um, but some people don't realize that they can uh, manipulate that configuration more deeply and actually prevent certain maybe uninteresting stats from being passed uh, by the Telegraph agent. Uh, from a data node perspective, these are the sort of highlights uh, as you're using Influx, or sorry, using Telegraph to monitor Influx. Um, we're doing a 15 second collection interval, as I mentioned, and we're keeping that data hot for 14 days. That's typically sufficient uh, for all of the debugging kind of work and, and uh, evaluation work that we need to do. Why 14 days? Most of you have retention periods that will result in a seven day shard size from a shard duration perspective, and then we want to see two of those. Right? So I can see two cycles of everything from a compaction perspective, shards going cold across a two week window. That is sufficient to diagnose literally any problem within Influx. So again, I realize like if you're operating cloud services or, or maybe uh, larger software properties, your mileage may vary in terms of like how long you need to keep that information, but that's another factor to think about as you're sort of operating and running these things is what is sufficient? Like I don't need a year's worth of data typically at 15 second resolution for me to do diagnoses. Well, what are the most common things that happen within in your environments and then sort of tuning your, your metrics collection to make sure that you can dial that in really, really tight. And that's something again, we've, we've been working on over time. Um, we enabled the ping endpoint uh, on the hosts. Um, and while that's available and I can ping from inside the cloud property, so Telegraph is pinging the individual data nodes um, I'll come back to what we missed. Um, 
having that ping from the customer perspective is kind of important, um, especially as we shift, shifted from ELB to ALB, and we'll talk a bit about that in a minute. Okay, on the meta node side, um, there's some, just some additional information uh, that we've uh, configured. Again, ping for the meta nodes themselves to make sure they're alive. And then we're also looking at a very specific uh, location of the file system for the uh, meta node snapshots. So meta nodes essentially don't do anything about 80% of the time, uh, unless you're doing some sort of heavy backup or restore activity. The meta nodes are essentially there to coordinate three things. One is the shard placement. Um, and so information about shards as you're sort of feeding data in. Um, it, will, it will determine shard ID. It'll determine th things like the series key space. Um, and the snapshot is there. So if a meta node dies and then wakes back up, they're using the RAF protocol to communicate with each other and determine whether they're in the latest and greatest state. The snapshot is essentially used as a reference. And that snapshot is shared with maybe a node that died and came back online later. It fi figures out it's out of, out of sequence with the rest of the information. And the snapshot gets pushed over to, from the leader uh, to the one that's recovered. And so we are, we're actually looking at that specific mount point uh, within the file system to make sure uh, we see what it's, its health and availability and that sort of thing is. Um, OK, so that's the meta node setup. From an output perspective, we're sending it all to our monitoring cluster that I mentioned. Uh, super simple, and we just set it up. I've clearly put in our usernames and passwords here, so you can hack into that if you want. Um, that's available. Uh, gathering of logs. So when we gather the log information, um, this is the kind of setup that we're using. So we're gathering and we're dropping it into um, a different database. So in this case, I've got my metrics collection here for Telegraph, and I'm dropping all measurements that start with syslog. So anything that's coming out that syslog name doesn't go into that database. I'm actually routing that to a separate uh, database. So I can control the retention policy and periods differently than the metrics. So if I wanted to gather my metrics for 30 days and my logs for five, I could actually dial that in. Yeah, sir. Uh, what is the impact to performance when we send from Telegraph to Telegraph to be? Yeah, I mean, it depends on the size of the data packets that you're sending, obviously. And so a lot of that is up to you to control in terms of like batch size, frequency of push, the number of telegraph or the number of uh, plugins that you've configured. Uh, the data are reused or are... Yeah, the data is reused, but it opens a second HTTP connection and pushes the entire packet so to that target. Network, network, it will be the main, HTTP connection and network will be the primary things. But from a reuse and of the packaging up of the information, it should be the same. It doesn't like try to create two separate and unique payloads and push them across. As a matter of fact, that's actually one of the criticisms right now of Telegraph is people want to be able to set up and route two different sets of outputs, one to one instance and one to a separate instance. So we're looking to enhance that. Um, as we go forward with Telegraph, but that will create uh, the overhead that you're worried about, which is um, sort of stealing the resources from the processor, uh, potentially end memory of the agent as it's doing that collection. Because you've got, now got two independent payloads that you're trying to push across. But we haven't seen that as a huge bottleneck on, on the setup the way it is now, because it's the same information being pushed to both. Um, yeah, so in this case, uh, we're filtering and uh, sending those elements. And so again, um, different retention uh, same or different retention policies can be achieved now that I've got separate databases. OK. So I set up and gathered a bunch of data. Cool, including logs. That's great. Now what? Um, so then we started to build dashboards. And some of you might be surprised. I'll, I'll go through a demo of this in a little bit. But I have an instance-based dashboard today. Um, and this little tiny writing in the upper Left-hand corner here is the cluster ID. So from an ID perspective, I can actually do a drop list. I can see all the instances that are there. I can pick one that I want to drill down into, and I can look at the cluster stats, health, and availability metrics that are all there. And not surprisingly, I also have this dashboard in Grafana. So 
Uh, initially, we were heavily, heavily using Grafana um, as the means for all the dashboard visualizations. The support team is now largely using Chronograph, but they both exist. Um, so, common metrics to watch. Now, those of you, again, who stayed from the last session um, and kind of heard from Dean about the hinted handoff queue and what happens there, the hinted handoff queue exists to achieve eventual consistency for the enterprise setup. So if you have more than one data node, which is what you want for enterprise, and you have RF equal to more than one, uh, we have a customer that actually has a 10 node cluster with RF of one, which um, gives them nice scale out in a certain way, but not a lot of durability in terms of failure. Um, so when you, when you choose a replication factor higher than one and you have more than one data node, then the hinted handoff queue will be the helper if the communication is lost between any of the data nodes. And so that's a, that's a metric that we absolutely watch. Now, one of the things that we did wrong was originally we set up to be alerted whenever the hinted handoff queue started to fill. How many people like to sleep? <laughs> yeah. How many people want to be paged at 2 a.m. Uh, for a hinted handoff queue that lasted for 30 or 40 seconds. Yeah, that's what I thought. So uh, we like to sleep too every now and again. Um, I was actually managing and monitoring 150 of these instances with three people worldwide. Okay, so I don't know how, what the size of the landscape and properties of things that, that you're all working with, but that seemed like a lot to me. So each SRE, including me, I was one of them, uh, was managing about 50 of these instances in a dedicated way. And the idea is that generally what that means to me is Influx is generally working very well and we didn't have a ton of issues, um, but we kept tweaking and tuning the alerting, the frequency of alerting, the thresholds that we wanted to have in place so that some of us could sleep every now and again. Um, but what we did want to look at is what's the difference between paging somebody as an actionable sort of severity one or maybe severity two event versus something that needed investigation in normal business hours, right? Through the course of a business day after you're well rested, uh, you could dive in and, and see what's happening. So one of the things that we ended up dialing in over time is we don't actually alert uh, someone through a pay, in a pageable way until the uh, hinted handoff queue exceeds three, three gigabytes. So there's lots of different failure conditions that occur that may cause the hinted handoff queue to, big, to build up to half a gig or a gigabyte. But the recovery processes that we already have in place from Automatron, uh, the Docker containers, et cetera, will allow the, the nodes to recover. And it is an eventually consistent database. And it's part of the system. And it's intended to be there as a service to make this all work. But it should only be a pageable event if you exceed that certain threshold. Does that make sense? Yes, sir. Yeah, I'll show you that in the demo, okay? So if you can see if I actually don't answer your question, then you can ask me again, but I'll show you in the demo what we've got set up from an alerting perspective. Um, we're looking at disk usage, that's another thing. Um, it is surprising to me in the 21st century how many people call support and say, I've run out of disk space. <laughs> can you please help me? And that's for the enterprise customers. So for the cloud side of things, um, I don't want to run out of disk space, so not for you. I'm your ops team. I should never run out of disk space. Um, again, as I mentioned, when you buy Influx Cloud today and Cloud, cloud version one, um, there's a certain amount of storage that's provisioned for your instance, and we've obviously provisioned slightly more because we do things like <laughs> compaction cycles and other things. But I, I look at that metric very closely, and if you're, you're getting close to exceeding that threshold, that's a, that's a pageable event. I want to make sure that um, we don't run out of disk space for you. Um, and then the last one is if you don't get any metrics. That seems important. Like if your instance winks out because Amazon decided to steal all those machines for some other activity they wanted to work on. Um, so we set up dead man alerts. So that's, a, that's definitely a pageable event. If a set of hosts go missing, um, that seems important to investigate. So some of the things that we set up, disk usage. Um, this is a drill down of, of what the uh, tick script looks like for um, a batch task to uh, evaluate what's going on from a disk perspective. And I know some of you are taking pictures of this, and that's great. Um, I've actually written all of this down for you. <laughs> it is, is literally in the documentation. So um, 
Uh, if, if you want me to stand closer to it and take my picture with it, that is not in the documentation. Okay, um, but yeah, I, th these are things that are available to you. Um, and again, as part of the sort of lessons learned of monitoring a large fleet of the same kind of software, um, you know, it just dawned on us that, hey, we should probably share these best practices and techniques that we're using to manage Influx Enterprise for customers that are buying Influx Enterprise. Um, and so there's a whole section in the documentation that I'll show you if you haven't stumbled across it already called the platform section, where we try to share both the dashboards that we use, the tick scripts that are available, what these metrics all mean behind the scenes, and which ones we're actually uh, paying attention to. Um, so this is the one for the, for the, uh, uh, the disk usage. Obviously the paths in terms of where you're mounting, um, the data directories, the wall directories, and the hinted handoff directories may vary based on your deployment and configuration. And obviously I'm keeping track of the root directory as well because sometimes weird stuff happens in the root. I'm like, what is, what, like, did you know, somebody jump on that box? Are they doing a backup? Are they pulling some data in? Um, so it's important to keep an eye on the things that are, uh, that are important from your infrastructure. Second, um, this is the alert side of it. So if I detect, if I do the detection through the disk usage, then the alert is set up like this. So I generate an alert. I've got a warning threshold at 85% and a critical threshold at 95%. So this is one of those things where, you know, as you're looking at the alerting, do I want to send an alert to Slack as a warning and then a pageable event to PagerDuty or OpsGenie or one of those sorts of things? Um, and I can change that uh, based off of, um, you know, setting those different thresholds. Similarly, uh, for hinted handoff queue, so this is the evaluation. We're looking at um, max queue bytes um, that exist over a, uh, that five minute period and looking at it every 10 minutes. Um, and then there's a division that's going on here to translate it into uh, a human readable form. Um, and then the alert side of it looks like this. So 3.5 gigabytes is when we have the warning and a half a gig, which is half the size of the hinted handoff queue uh, is when someone gets paged. Now, in certain cases, we've had to adjust that. So um, I have a customer that sends me 10 gigabytes of information every 90 minutes. Um, they, they're pouring in a lot of data, as it turns out, and they have extra storage. Um, and so uh, the challenge was if I got paged when the hinted handoff queue was already half full, um, I had 45 minutes to get to a computer from anywhere in the world, which sometimes is a challenge if you're stuck in traffic, for example. Um, and so, yeah, we've, we've looked at tr making some adjustments to this over time just based off of, um, uh, you know, specific customer use cases, those sorts of things. Okay, where to look for this in the documentation so that you can rest that photo finger. Um, this whole blue section is where I'm trying to highlight this. It may be too subtle, but let me know. Uh, we can make it brighter. Um, start here. And one of the biggest questions we get asked from a support perspective is how do I monitor influx? And that has guides for specifically monitoring and administration of both the open source and the enterprise and the associated dashboards that we use every day. And all that telegraph configuration stuff. And I believe some of the tick scripts are in there, in there as well. Um, but definitely check that out. But it's one of those things where you're like, oh, I'm doing this cool monitoring thing using Influx and it was super easy when I was doing open source to a point where I'm now deploying my open source into production and I want, to, I want to do some monitoring. How do I even do that? And people haven't ever looked at that page. So I encourage you to have a look. From a troubleshooting perspective, um, something that can happen in enterprise called an OOM loop. Anybody have experience with this? Yeah, yes, yes, I know you have. We've been on a call together. Um, <laughs> so, so an OOM loop is when um, if you're if the uh, particular data node is running out of memory based on some activity that you're attempting to perform, like, oh, I don't know, select star from, okay, please put a date range on that query. Um, if you're trying to dump the entire contents of your database out, I will guarantee you, you'll oom the box. So in our case, the, when we see something like this, it normally means that there's an activity going on on a data node or both data nodes that requires more resources. Now, from a cloud perspective, the nice thing that we have access to is I can scale you up. I can scale up this instance, uh, give it some more resources, and see if it's a system-related constraint, or if it's a user-related constraint, we can talk through that a little bit. 
um, and then decide how we get back down to either plan size or maybe it's appropriate that it's time to move on to the next set of resources. But you will also have visibility and access to the co-monitoring feature to see um, that information. In this case, I think this was caused by, yeah, some large query that got sent in. And yeah, so then we ended up upscaling um, that instance and uh, working through that particular query. Other thing that occurs, uh, runaway series cardinality. So Dean probably mentioned this as well. One of the more popular things to do is misconfigure your telegraph agent. Deploy that out using Puppet or Chef or Ansible to many, many, many systems. And then what we'll see is instead of the cardinality slowly rising from 6 million to 8 million over the course of a week, you might see that go in the course of an hour. Okay? That could be bad, right? So um, it's another thing that we look, we look out for uh, and then attempt to contact customers and sort of troubleshoot uh, through those kinds of things. So rapid growth in, in cardinality is a sure sign that something may have gone haywire. Now, in some cases, it's what you intended, and that's okay, but it's better for us to check. Again, we're your ops team, and if we haven't heard you know, that kind of feedback, we definitely want to check on it. So big things to check on. What type of workload are you, right? So we want to understand from our perspective when we're looking at the stats that we've collected, are you read heavy, are you write heavy, or are you a mixed workload? We definitely have customers in all three of those buckets. We have some customers that trickle in a very, very, very tiny amount of data on a regular basis, but their query volume is massive, right? They have a lot of customers that are accessing the data, but it's just not a lot of data. And then we have the reverse, where they're pouring in tons and tons and tons of data, but their query volume is just light. And then you got customers in the middle, like mixed, mixed read and write workloads. But the important part is when you're gathering all those stats and information is we're trying to establish a baseline for what these things look like and what is considered normal, right? What's a normal scenario so that then you can de determine and detect and set those alert targets in terms of what is not normal and then who needs to be either notified or alerted uh, appropriately. Next is uh, IOPS and disk throughput. Really important to understand the throughput capacity that's uh, been allocated to you. One of the challenges that we've run into um, is with some of the larger customers that are on Influx Cloud, um, they started capping out the IOPS of their box. So um, if those are not, those of you not familiar with the way that Amazon does this, um, the, uh, Amazon essentially looks at a machine class and says, hmm, we guess that you can't push more than X amount of data through this box, so we're going to limit the amount of IOPS available to that piece of hardware uh, based on their sort of guesstimate. It turns out Influx can push a lot more through, as it turns out. Uh, so um, we've hit those caps. And so the way this manifests itself is you're looking at a particular uh, graph of the, of the IOPS being consumed by that machine, and it just flatlines. So everything starts to back up. So it's really important to understand, again, by plan size or by resource class that you're deploying where those limits are and that you need to know those. Also, then you can set um, your alert targets and thresholds right on that and say if you're either approaching that or you're exceeding or you're not, you can't exceed it, but you hit it for some sustained duration, you get notified. And you don't have to go diving into to, to graphs to figure that out. And then log analysis. So again, we're a big believer. You heard Evan mention this, metrics first. Um, but logs provide all context, right? Logs provide super meaningful and helpful context, particularly for that like OOM loop scenario that I showed you. How do you determine what caused that OOM? Was it a compaction? Was it a big query? Was it something else? So the metrics tell you where to look. Logs provide that context. There's other things that pop up, hit the handoff queue blocked, that tells me that something's wrong with the file system. Cache max memory size tells me you've exceeded something in the memory pool. So a bunch of those sorts of things. All right, so let's, I have one minute to do a quick demo. So we will attempt to do that, maybe. Okay, so I've logged into the cloud instance and I may zoom in a little bit here. So one of the things that you can see here are these are the sort of standard dashboards that we're using. Um, cluster stats uh, is the uh, overall health and dashboard co-monitoring, so I can actually see what you see. 
Um, I have a war room dashboard. Um, my war room dashboard, I like to call going to the balcony, right? So if you think about how I'm monitoring 300 and some odd instances of these things, I can go on an instance by instance basis, right? And so I can go into a particular dashboard, let's say, uh, we'll look at the health of some cluster that exists. I'm gonna just pick one maybe at random. So this is a uh, six node cluster running 192 CPUs. Um, this is a bit on the larger side. Um, each node has 10 terabytes of disk uh, allocated to it and currently they're using slightly more than half. Uh, so from, oh, I need to adjust my time range on this. So if I adjust the time range, let's just look at this for the last six hours. Um, so I can see availability at 100%. Um, I can see my CPU utilization for uh, the, the data nodes is sort of running. The data nodes are sort of this fall color here. They're running at you know, 15 to 20%. They got tons of overhead from a CPU perspective. From a, a RAM perspective, um, the data nodes are operating sort of uh, 20 to 30%, which is really healthy. They can sustain a lot more workload. When I go down and sort of see what's going on, they're issuing uh, roughly uh, 30 writes a second per data node, and the n volume of metrics that they're pouring in is somewhere between 22,000 and 25,000 lines of line protocol per node uh, every second. This is a lot of data, just in case you didn't do the math. Uh, okay, uh, and then from a query perspective, it's about two queries per second per node, so that's not, that's not huge. So this is one that I would consider to be write heavy, right, and not read heavy. Um, as we scroll down, I like to see blank graphs here, hinted handoff queue, empty, shard write errors, zero, that's good. Um, heap size, directory root used, uh, this uh, query duration, 99th percentile, says at one point they had, a, they had a query that was super, super long, but generally speaking, their queries are running uh, very, very consistently. If we needed to dive into that, if we saw that sort of spiking up and down, that might be a way to have a conversation about what query that is and is there a way to optimize it. We can look at the shard write duration over here on the left, and then uh, I've got a sum of the disk throughput from a both read and write perspective. And you notice it looks like nice spiky behavior, no flat lines, um, nice and available. I have a drill down in terms of just the IOPS here on a per node basis. Again, nice spiky behavior, no, no flat lines. And that's great, I can look at each of those individual things on a, on a cluster by cluster basis. But as I moved from being an individual SRE to managing a much larger team, I was not spending my time in these dashboards looking at individual alerts. And I thought to myself, how do I go to the balcony and look over the whole property, right? And so this is sort of the, one of the next levels of things is to go out and say, well, if I can look at the drill down of an individual thing, can I create a war room sort of view of everything, like for example, hosts with fewer than five containers running. I don't care what cluster it's on, but I know at a minimum there should be five containers running on every cluster. And if it's not, that's probably some place to pinpoint and drill down and look at. So obviously there's one that the support team is likely looking at right now. How about service health availability overall? So we're running at 99.99%. And I could put some more decimals on there, but I only care about the first two. Um, uh, anyway, so you get the sense, like this is actually cluster wide, and what we did was we're now, or, or sorry, property wide, every region, every cluster, we're just trying to highlight and pinpoint ones that might be uh, places to go and look at. Like for example, somebody here, uh, 86BC, is starting to get hinted handoff growth. So they've lost one data node for some reason, and now they're starting to see this grow. This, this spiky behavior, nobody got paged, nothing happened here, that's normal. This one that's sort of growing over the last two hours is likely gonna hit a pageable target here in the next few minutes. Uh, failed CQs, it's another thing to drill down on with a customer. So if, if somebody's trying to execute a continuous query that's not working, um, any cluster that's not running at 100%, so we got one at 99 and one at 98, again, specific drill down to highlight to the team. So that, I call that kind of going to the balcony. From an alerts perspective, to try to answer your question, a little bit in more detail. Um, let's see if I can bring these up. We use the, um, the chronograph alert builder, maybe, 
to uh, craft most of these alerts. Mm, slow connection. That's weird. Okay, rather than spending time on that, it's about a dozen is what we ended up with. Um, dozen is the rough target, um, and there's, there, all of them have multi-threshold. So some of them are just warns, and some of them are, um, yeah, I'm not sure why that's doing that, but, um, and some of them are just, uh, uh, like I said, pageable. So let's finish this up, because I think everybody is hungry. Is that true? All right, so then quickly, just to wrap, what do we miss? So many things, so many things. When we started this, we thought, oh, if we just get all that cool information I showed you, that should be enough. I could be able to run this whole thing with two, three people, no problem. So one, as we built a bigger team out, a shift from instance space to trying to create that high level view of the property, that fleet management. How many of you are operating something you would consider to be like a fleet, like devices or many, many things that are stamped out multiple times? Yeah, you've got that problem, you in the back, okay. So I, I think of that as a fleet management issue. I need, I need to see the whole thing, but I, then I need to drill down into individual instances. First thing we missed, I, I enabled the ping endpoint. We collect, co collected uh, ping stats from inside the firewall. So what's your experience? You're outside the firewall. If you can't reach your instance and I think it's healthy, guess whose problem that is? Not yours. <laughs> so. Uh, one other thing is we wanted to look at the real user monitoring impact by coming in through the front door. We actually shifted from using dedicated ELB instances on a per cluster basis to using an ALB across the entire property or for 90 or so things, as I mentioned. And in the, doing that shift, if I wasn't coming through the front door, that's a problem. Um, we also integrated with our subscription management system to then understand what we should be watching from the front door perspective. And that's happening all in real time. That's one of the limitations of Telegraph today is Telegraph is a sort of static uh, configuration that gets pushed out. So we used a lot of the guts of Telegraph to build something that would refresh its configuration based on credit card swipes that were going in and, and frankly, some, you know, some cancellations so that we were looking at this from the front door. Um, SSL cert expiration, there's another embarrassing thing. Anybody ever have this happen to them? This is second only to disk space, right? Shouldn't have certs expiring. We have a Telegraph plugin for that, so we should probably turn that one on. Uh, and then last is uh, monitoring of the e-commerce system itself. So as you log into the cloud infrastructure, you have the ability to buy storage and to purchase add-ons and sort of look at those sorts of things. We had an SRE log in and change the password that was used by the API to integrate our e-commerce system with our subscription management system, and then the two didn't talk to each other. And nobody could buy anything new for about a week. So uh, we don't get it right all the time, but just to tell you, like this whole thing, right? it's a journey. You start layering in these pieces, and then you determine where you want to uh, improve and enhance your experience over time. So recap, Mark, because he's kicking me off the stage, and it's Getting definitely time down. for food. Gather metrics and logs for context. Build the visualization elements, monitor those, understand the healthy baselines, build your alerts, tune those things over time. Another thing that we saw from an alerting perspective is we could be alerted to certain conditions sooner rather than later, right? So if I, if I misjudged where the hinted handoff queue needed to be, maybe I need to dial that down. If I'm watching things through the front door, maybe I want that to occur in minutes rather than hours. Iterate. Perfection is the enemy of progress. You're, okay? Some smart person said that. I think it was Evan. Okay? Iterate and address for new scenarios to continue to eliminate alert fatigue. So that OOM loop condition, that's something where we started uh, notifying SREs very, very regularly of, of out-of-memory conditions. But we actually only care about the out-of-memory condition if it continues to occur, not if it only occurs one time. So if I execute one query and the node crashes and then comes back online, similar to the hinted handoff queue buildup and, and, and uh, playing out of that data, I don't need to be alerted to that. The system self-heals. I don't need to worry about that. What I need to worry about is if that's constantly happening. And so detecting that, 
and sort of eliminating that alert fatigue is super critical. Definitely visit the community. We've got lots of folks out there answering questions, the DevRels from our team. Definitely check out those docs. If this blue section needs to be a little brighter, let me know. Use my Twitter handle, tweet that out. Happy to, happy to get that feedback. And last but not least, thank you for those that signed up for the cloud uh, beta overnight. For those of you that have some extra free time, and I know you have day jobs, and we do appreciate you being here in the last couple days, but definitely check out the, the Cloud 2 beta. That is it.